First speaker of Act Two is a minister, mom, partner, overthinker, shuttle driver, warrior, armchair world problem solver, religious nerd, lover of mountains and all Mexican food. She's currently taking a year off to find her next. Please welcome Sheena Trotter Dennis. I'm excited to be here and I was so excited that I was trying to get all my family to come including my nine-year-old but she said to me tonight she's like uh, I think I want the night off so there you go <laughs> all right here we go what's next that's a question I've probably been asked a million times and I'm sure you have too as soon as you can talk, people begin to ask that question. At every milestone, graduation, job change, relationship change, or whenever your elderly relatives visit you, the question comes up. We like to know that people are moving forward. And since day one, the word next has defined me. Here I am at 18 months old, already running toward the goal. I've always known what was next, my next steps, my next moves, even when things changed or didn't work out, there was always a goal, a direction, a next some way to move forward. We organize our lives around the next. And for 44 years, this system worked really well for me because in North America, I believe we live in a culture of next. This is our dominant way of being. We want to know the next goal, the next job, the next trip, the next post, the next whatever. And like millions of other people, my life was driven by the next until it wasn't. <laughs> At the beginning of this year, I found myself with no next. Nothing was percolating. Call it a midlife crisis or a shift in thinking or a nudge or a consequence of my situation or privilege, it was all of these things. But whatever the label, having no next was disorienting to say the least, and I wasn't sure what I was gonna do. I had achieved a lot of nexts already, and I was fairly sure I still had some nexts left ahead of me, but it drove me crazy not to have the next thing in front of me. Having a next moves us forward. It keeps us going. It gives us a reason for being. And without a next, my, my life seemed disordered and lacking in purpose. And so after some sleepless nights and daily heart palpitations, I decided I needed to focus on figuring out the next. And so I went to my favorite place, my bookshelf, and I dusted off a book about discernment by Henry Nouwen, the Catholic priest and writer of spirituality. Now this might seem odd, but I am a minister, so it seemed normal in my circles. <laughs> Discernment is the ancient practice of listening so that we might hear an answer to the question, what's next? For hundreds of years, people have practiced this. Everyone from monks to modern day people like you and me. There's nothing magical about it. It's simply paying attention to your life in a different way, in a mindful way with the intention of finding the next. And what I learned was that sometimes when you're looking for the next, you miss the wide open spaces of the now. You forget to pay attention. You forget to listen and you forget that your life is big and wide and full of potential. And you need that open space of the now to get you to the next. And so I decided to spend the next 12 months trying to pay attention <laughs> and trying not to force the next. But I wasn't gonna sit and meditate for a year or back away from everything or move to a monastery or renounce all my possessions. I just wanted to make some space and try not to panic. And so what I was hoping was that my life might look a little like this view from the Leighton Art Center. A wide open space, an expansive vista, no boundaries or limitation, sky's the limit, enough space to breathe and to imagine and to see new possibilities. But, truth be told, the year started off looking more like this. The first month, my thoughts were all over the place. My poor brain was trying to plan the next, and it couldn't just be still and listen. Instead, I had a million ideas swirling around in my head, and my brain kept trying to reorder the chaos. I wanted to put myself back in a box, back into something familiar, back into order, and preferably with a plan in place. The conversation in my head went something like this. Okay, I like food. Maybe I'll move to France and become a pastry chef. <laughs> or gardening, I should be a horticulturalist. Or bears, I love bears. A park ranger is what I should be. <laughs> I like how my brain thought I could be an expert in every field. I wanted a next, even if it wasn't logical. As my brain was trying to reboot and make sense of not having a next, the self-doubt began to show up. 
So I went back to my bookshelf and pulled out the self-help books and booked time with a therapist and a spiritual director and a chiropractor and a physio and a trainer and my doctor. Sometimes you have too much time and space. After the initial unease and self-doubt, things calmed down a bit, but I began to realize just how ingrained this need for the next is in our lives. We like to have a path forward, and we like other people to know where they're headed also. As I began telling people about my year of now and that I didn't have a next, it was as if I disturbed the order of the universe. Apparently, having no next makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Some offered me suggestions of what I could do next. Others tried to find a way for me to go back to what I was doing before. Some wrote me off completely. But everyone still wanted to know what my next was, like they weren't getting it. It did not compute. Everyone's always ready to get to the next. Except my dog, Oliver. He was into it. He lives in the moment. He sits and takes it all in. He chases birds and toys. He eats when he's hungry. He takes a nap when he's tired. He loves people when he wants to. I'm pretty sure he's not planning his next. Just living in the now. It's good to be Oliver. I'm trying to be more like him, living into the wide open space of the now, stripping away the pressure to find the next. I'd like to say after five months that I'm an expert in the now, but it's for sure more of a day by day, minute by minute situation. But I'm trying my best to embrace it. And so some days that looks like coffee with friends, and sometimes it looks like reading. Some days I walk, some days I'm in therapy, some days I'm worrying, some days I'm wasting the day on Facebook, some days I'm volunteering, some days I sit in a meeting, and some days I'm trying to tackle the never-ending pile of laundry in my basement. Some days are much more spacious than others. But don't let the mountain vistas and lattes fool you. Trying to live into the now or into the now and not focus on the next is still uncomfortable and unnatural. That 18-month-old child leaning forward and running to the next thing is still who I am in many ways. There are still days of self-doubt and days of heart palpitations and days of wondering if I'll ever get to the next. But that's the thing about our dependence on the next. Sometimes it keeps us from being comfortable with the now. And what we really need is the wide open spaces of the now and the reminder that the now is enough and the next will come.